And welcome to Advantage Radio Ministries and welcome to Second Chances here at Lift FM. This is our weekly program in which if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then you understand that Jesus has given us all a second chance by going to the cross to die for our sins that we could have life and have it more abundantly. However, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the reason we put this program on is actually for you to let you know that uh, God has done many great things, but the best thing of all is that he loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die to the cr- or die on the cross for our sins. And before this program is over, we're going to give you the opportunity to be set free. If you'd like to ask Jesus Christ in your heart, the Lord's been tugging at you, and you know that the way you're living is just not uh, correct, and, and it just doesn't feel right, but you've been searching and searching and searching for something, we're going to give you the opportunity to, to be set free before this program is done, and we just uh, thank you for that opportunity. We also thank uh, our guest today, T.J. McLeslie. He is a follower of Christ, a husband, a father, a minister, a missionary, and an author. And uh, T.J., it's no doubt about it that uh, the Lord always, uh, they always say that the Lord can't use uh, lazy people. Well, no doubt about it, you're a busy guy. <laughs> yes, I suppose that's true. He's He's, he's uh, my dad used to say that the, that the Lord uses uh, children and fools, and I ain't no child. So. <laughs> well, TJ, <laughs> weak in the foolish things of the world, doesn't he? Yes, yes, he does. Uh, TJ, before we go any further, I just have to ask: Are you on a speakerphone? And if you are, could you get off the speakerphone? We're having difficulty hearing you. I'm sorry. I'm actually I'm calling in from overseas, so I'm actually not on the speakerphone. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. We had a little bit of. Uh, a little bit of uh, uh, difficulty there, but uh, I believe that uh, we'll be just fine. So tell us who T.J. McLeslie is, where you're from, and a, a little bit about you. Sure. Um, I grew up in Southern California, um, was uh, born and raised in a, in a home um, that uh, knew and loved, my, my parents knew and loved Christ. And um, Although I grew up in a Christian home, didn't always make good choices, made a whole slew of bad choices, suffered some difficult things in the church, from the church, um, spent some years running um, quite a prodigal, to be honest. Um, but the Lord got a hold of me and drew me back to himself. And I, I love the, the title of your program, Second Chances, because I've definitely had a, a second, third, fourth, fifth chance. And uh, in the in the last uh, nearly 20 years now, the Lord has called me to to live and to work overseas in missions, and specifically, um, I've spent most of my adult life living in, in the Muslim world, and uh, just being a witness for Christ and helping to plant churches, um, and, and now I serve uh, in a capacity where I'm, I'm caring for and supporting and encouraging and training missionaries all over the world from our base here in the UK. Mm. So let's go back for a minute. Uh, how did the Lord get a hold of you to... Uh help get your life uh, right to give you that second, third, fourth, fifth chance? What did the Lord do in your case? Well, in, in my case, I, um, as I mentioned, I grew up in a Christian home, um, but at the age of uh, 12, I was uh, sexually abused by a, a worker in the church, a, uh, a children's worker. And that caused me to um, really just sent me into a tailspin spiritually and with guilt and shame and fear, and um, it, and so it was in the next year or so, I started to um, unfortunately go the wrong direction and to search um, for relief from my suffering um, in drugs and in alcohol, and that continued all through my teen years uh, until um, just um, after my 18th um, birthday, um, somebody invited me. Uh, that I had been around the church. My, my parents required me to go to church. So all of those uh, years that I was um, really making a, a lot of horrendous choices, I, I was still going to church every Sunday. My parents would sometimes drag me out of bed with a hangover and say, you're coming to church. <laughs> and um, so really, uh, against my will, um, in many ways, I was continued to be exposed to the truth of God's Word, although it wasn't really penetrating. Um, around my 18th birthday, um, somebody invited me to go on a, a church camp to a church in, out in California called Hume Lake. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's kind of a big big uh, Christian camping organization out west. And um, I, 
I didn't, I wasn't really interested in God at that point. I had, I was still fairly hostile um, because of the things that I had experienced. Um, but, but I, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll take a trip to the mountains. I like the mountains. And so I went along in this camp and as it turns out, I, I ducked out of most of the meetings, but just uh, walked up in the woods and walked around the lake up there and um, t- sitting on a rock um, overlooking the mountains um, re- I started. I read the Bible probably for the first time in, in many years, and um, came to the realization that regardless of what had happened in my life, and regardless of the shortcomings of some of, of God's people, that Jesus really was who He said He was. And and so we talked um, for the first time in many years on on that mountainside, and uh, came down that mountain with a, a, a renewed relationship with Him. Mm. What do you think it is, uh, T.J., uh, you know, if you, you read the Bible, you know that the Lord oftentimes spoke to people uh, on the mountain, Moses and others, to uh, name a few. Uh, what do you think it is about being in a, in a higher elevation that causes that closeness to the Lord? That's a great question. Um, I would say it's not always necessarily a higher elevation, um, because oftentimes in Scripture um, it's also in the desert, you know, but but the, the thing that I think is, is unique about both the mountains and the desert, um, and I've even had similar experiences sort of on the seaside, would, would be getting away from um, the, our normal day-to-day um, environments, especially now. Our, our environments are filled with so much noise and information coming at us through the radio and television and internet and our, you know, our smartphones, so they're always with us now. And interrupting us and distracting us. And when we go away, I, Henry Mallon, in his book, The Way of the Heart, talks about that solitude and silence are actually the foundation, the most foundational spiritual disciplines, because if we do not practice solitude and silence, if we don't get away and create space for quietness, then we can't hear our own hearts. And, it, and even more importantly, um, we sort of just drowned out the voice of God. So I think that getting away to the mountains or to the beach or to the to the desert where where there's stillness and quiet and silence, in in some ways forces us to deal with ourselves and and um, creates the stillness where we can hear the voice of God. I, I'm sure he's, I know He's speaking to us all the time, but but when we're so distracted and our no, our, our lives are filled with noise, it's harder to hear Him. So I think those kinds of environments. Um, really um, are more, much more conducive for hearing Him. Mm. Be still and, and know that uh, I am God. Um, Absolutely. Design for Relationships, Learning to Love God with All We Are is the book by T.J. McLeslie. And T.J., before we continue, continue our interview, uh, is there a website that one could visit to learn more about uh, you, your book, and things of that nature? Yeah, um, the, the, the book itself has a website. It's www.dfrbook.com. And so that you can, you can get some excerpts from the book if you want to have a little taste. Um, so there's some sections of the book that are on the, on the site um, and some endorsements from various people and uh, even, I think, an interview with the book designer. Um, and then if, if people want to just sort of catch up with me on, on – Twitter or um, Instagram or Facebook, things like that. There's a, a site called, um, called about.me forward slash TJ underscore McLeslie, and that's where all of my sort of social media stuff, I'm connected through there, so people can um, keep up with me personally through that as well. Okay. I'd love to interact with my with people who are reading the book. It's, I find I find writing a book an interesting... I'm, I'm a preacher more by nature than, a, than an author, and so I find writing a book is an interesting thing because I, I, I pour a sermon, if you will, onto the pages of the book, but I never get to interact with or rarely get to interact with people who are reading it um, or who are responding to it. So I love to interact with people if possible. Mm. That uh, website, once again, is dfrbook.com, and uh, the other social media sites will bring that up uh, again throughout the program. Uh, TJ, I want to go back to something you mentioned about uh, the missions field. You currently mentioned you're in the uh, United Kingdom, uh, and you also mentioned that um, you spend a lot of time uh, ministering to Muslims. And mm-hmm. uh, and here in the United States, we often uh, hear discussed uh, 
that uh, in, in some cases we are not very well liked by Muslims. Uh, how, how does that work in, in, in what you do, trying to, to minister to them, knowing that you are a, you know, a person from the United States uh, talking to the Muslims? How do, how do you overcome that uh, uh, difficult situation? Yeah, you know, um, when we were living in the Middle East, um, we, we were there um, during the Iraq War, and um, the, when, when the invasion happened, and, and people would sometimes, um, taxi drivers in particular, would say, hey, you know, what's going on? Why do Americans hate Muslims? And, and I would say, Americans don't hate Muslims. You know, I, I'm, I'm an American. I don't hate you. You know, do you hate me? And he said, no. And I said, okay, so let's just, people are people, you know. And he said, well, why is George Bush doing this? Or why is the government doing that? And I said, well, you know, next time I have lunch with them, I'll, I'll, I'll bring up your point, you know. And they would always stop and look at me, and they're like, you don't have lunch with the president. And I said, no, no, I don't. You know? And uh, I said, well, do you have lunch with your prime minister? And they said, well, no. And I said, so really, if we strip away the, the labels of, of ethnicity and even the religious labels, people are people. Um, and, and I found that when we could break down the sort of um, barriers that sort of cause us to not see people as people, but to see people as representatives of a group, as stereotypes, then it was amazing how, how easy it is to, to build relationships with people. We lived in a country that was 99.9 percent .9 Muslim. All of my neighbors knew that we were Christians. Um, for the first six months or so, they didn't want to have much relationship with us. They were suspicious that we were there um, to convert them, um, and they were um, desperately trying to convert us to, to Islam. Um, but over time, as we simply loved them and demonstrated our love for our kids, demonstrated our love for them and for their kids, um, they welcomed us into the community. And uh, we became a, a, a well-liked and well-established part of the community. And, and then we had opportunities. They would ask us, once they no longer felt threatened by us, if we, so they would, they would ask us, so, you know, what do you believe then? And then I had opportunities to, to share with them in, in the context of a, of a trusting friendship relationship to share with them, you know, this is, this is what I believe. And they'd say, oh, no, no, that, that can't possibly be true. And I said, well, you, you know, why don't, why don't you read it? You know, and I had the opportunities even to give Bibles um, to people, which is not something that you would be able to do just standing out on the street corner, um, but, but was something that you could do in the context of relationship, and they would receive them and, and, um, and, and read them. Uh, not everyone would read them, but, but one of the beautiful things about the Word of God is that it never returns void. And so the, the Word of God is now peppered throughout that neighborhood, um, sort of ticking away on the shelf there, that somebody can pull it down and, and read it in their own heart language and come to know God through His Word. Mm. Um, it says here that you've been involved in Christian ministry since uh, your first missions experience in 1990. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about that uh, missions experience, if you will, TJ. Sure, yeah. Uh, back in, in 1990, I was just finishing up university, and um, I really didn't have a particular heart um, for missions or anything like that. Um, I was finishing university, and I didn't have any particular plans. Um, specifically, I figured I might go to grad school or something. And um, a friend of mine was going on a short-term trip overseas for a year, a one-year commitment. And he said, well, why don't you come along? And I said, no, I'm not really interested. <laughs> and he said, well, why don't, you, why don't you pray about it? And I said, nah, I don't really want to pray about it. <laughs> and uh, and it was, I had only been walking with the Lord um, a couple of years at that point. I had to come back to the Lord. And um, he, he said, well, how about this? Why don't you just apply for the program? And, and if God wants you to go, you'll, you, know, you can get accepted. And so I applied for the program. And much to my surprise, I got accepted. Um, and then we, we prayerfully asked the Lord, um, everybody who was going on the program had to raise their own financial support or see the Lord raise it. And so I, I, I prayed and I, I shared with the, the church that I was, had grown up in. I said, you know, I had this opportunity. They said, do you feel called to missions? I said, not really, <laughs> but I have this opportunity and I, I don't know if this is something God wants me to do. If he does, then then he'll need to raise the support. 
three weeks later, um, $30,000 had been raised, which was a huge amount of money, um, even in those days. And um, I, then I was quickly running out of excuses. So really, before I knew what was happening, I found myself on a plane headed for Central Asia uh, for the former Soviet Union and um, found myself really on the mission field almost from a human perspective, almost by accident, but very providentially, um, and I think under God's providence, he was he was guiding and directing my steps there. Um, and once I got there, I found I I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed learning language. I enjoyed getting into the culture. Um, I seemed to have the ability to, um, while I missed my family, it wasn't a debilitating thing for me, uh, as it is for some people. And um, I was able to build relationships with locals. We saw that first year, first nine months we were there, we saw 70 people um, in a, among a people group who had never before uh, had a church came to, came to faith. And we saw a, a church that had never existed in a, in a, a people group that had never known the Lord before. Um, we saw tr- the church birth there. And now in that people group, there's over um, well over 10,000 Christians. Um, and the, the church is continuing to grow under indigenous leadership there. So that was, I kind of felt, I, I, I sometimes tell people I was dragged kicking and screaming in the missions, but I'm so glad that I was. Well, you know what they always say, the Lord always uh, gets what he wants, and uh, he found a very clever way to get you to uh, uh, finally come into your uh, his perfect will for you, huh? He, he did, he did. <laughs> uh, uh, the book we're going to talk about, uh, TJ, is... Uh, T.J. McLeslie is entitled Design for Relationship, Learning to Love God with All We Are. So so tell us, T.J., what led you to write uh, Design for Relationship in the first place? Well, the the, par- the paradigm in Design for Relationship, uh, it, it really, I guess Design for Relationship is really a summary of my understanding of who God is and how we relate to Him. And over the last uh, 10 years or so in particular, as I've been sort of providing leadership for, for some in the missions community and um, have been caring for um, their souls and to encourage them, I found that that um, people kept asking me, well, you know, is, can you, what, what, where is this stuff that you're teaching us? Where is this written down? And I said, well, I, I get, you know, it, it, it draw, I've drawn on like Dallas Willard and John Piper and Larry Crabb. It's certainly not all original with me, but there really wasn't, uh, it really wasn't written down somewhere. And so pe- really the, the motivation for this book was that people that I loved and cared for were asking me to write it. Um, and so that's where, that's where the impetus came from to actually sit down and write it. Um, I sat down to write this book um, five years ago. And um, actually, a different book came out as I sat down at the computer, which was really the story of how God got a hold of me in, in much greater detail, which is called my first one. My first book was Pursuit of a Thirsty Fool. But what I had d- intended to write was actually this book. Um, and so, so this book is essentially two parts. The first part is taking another look at the nature and character of God with a specific emphasis on the relational nature of God, the fact that God is not just one, a monolithic being, but that he is, in fact, three. The Trinitarian nature of God means that at his very core, God is relational. And then the second part of the book is looking at the implications for specifically how God has created us, that God has created us. We are inherently relational beings. Relationships aren't just a part of who we are. They're at the very core of who we are. And specifically, we were designed for relationship with other humans, but even more importantly, we were designed to be most human, most ourselves, most fully alive when we are connected with the God of the universe. And when we live in relationship with him, we are actually fulfilling our design, and it's the, we begin to experience the kind of life that God really has designed us to experience. You mentioned uh, that in the book, Design for Relationship, as you just mentioned, you spent some time talking about the Trinity. A couple of questions. Number one, for those that uh, don't know Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior or are very, very new to their, their walk with the Lord, first of all, tell us what the Trinity is, and secondly, can you explain to us why it is so important to you to, to spend time talking about it? Yes. Um 
one of the really amazing things about scripture is that there is you can you can read it and there's so many just beautiful things just laying on the surface of scripture um uh, but then there's also these really deep truths that um i mean often the most the deepest truths are just laying on the surface of scripture and you mentioned one of the deepest ones which is that jesus christ was very god and very man and he died on the cross for our sins it's a very clear very simple story for anyone to understand um it, children i you know i first heard the story when i was maybe three or four or five years old um it, even a child can understand it and yet the implications of these truths are so deep that we can spend our whole lives investigating them and not fully understand them. Uh, and so when we come to talk about the Trinity, we're talking about the fact that God has chosen to reveal himself, really from the very first chapter of Scripture all the way through the end of Scripture, as a we, as an us, as a community, as much as, as an individual. And so right there in the, in the book of Genesis, which is the very first book in the Bible, for, for those of your listeners that might not know, know that um god talks about let us make man in our image he uses plural to describe himself now he doesn't that's not the use of that plural is not fully explained and explored until thousands of years later there's this way that god is beginning to reveal himself and and revealing more and more about who he is and what his nature is and what his values are and who what his character is like all through the old testament culminating in the very clear and explicit teachings of the New Testament that explain a lot of the mystery that that was lying, lying, lay sort of unexplored or unexplained from the Old Testament. And that's where we discover Jesus very clearly talks about that there's God the Father, the, the Father God, who's the creator and sustainer of all things, God the Son, who is also God, um, but a unique person as part of the Godhead, and God the Holy Spirit, um, who uh, proceeds from the Father and the Son, and is is the the the, the person of God who dwells within us, um, and, and when we become a Christian, um, when we come to Christ, and so Jesus Christ died on the cross to to bring us back into re to relationship with the Trinitarian Godhead. So there's this great deep mystery that God is both one; there is only one God. And yet he exists in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And obviously it's a, it is a profound mystery, and yet the implications of that are free and, and easy for, for us to understand. And so really in, in my book, Design for Relationship, I don't – I mean really huge books, thousands of pages long have been written about the doctrine of the Trinity. That's not the purpose of my book. The purpose of my book is to say – understanding a very brief review of the fact that this is in fact very clearly and explicitly taught in scripture but then asking the question how do we go about what are the implications of that for our lives so not only what is the trinity but really why is the trinity and why is that important and it's important specifically because it demonstrates that god has been dancing this dance within himself this relational beautiful um Every human, every beautiful and right aspect of a human relationship is a, is a pale um, reflection of the beautiful, intricate, um, intimate relationship that has always existed between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so our, our um, capacity for relationship is actually a reflection of the nature and character of God in us. God said that he made us in his image. And one of the key aspects of that is that he made us relational. Mm. And so the fact that he is relational um, is grounded very deeply in uh, the core truth of, of the Trinity. We are visiting with T.J. McLeslie. He is the author of Design for Relationship. And, and T.J., what message would you say your book has for those who are trapped in a self-destructive behavior? Well, I mean, as one who has come out of um, and come through um, alcohol, drugs, and, and, and sexual addiction myself, um, I, that this is not a book that is written sort of from an ivory tower, like, hey, you know, you know, freedom is there, and you should really lay hold of it, and written from someone who's never experienced the dark side of life. Um, 
ha- having come into a relationship with Christ and have, growing into an understanding of what it means to really offer every part of my life to him, my body, my intellectual capacity, my emotional uh, relational capacities, my, my choices, um, and my spirit, all of learning to love God with every part of who I am has been the process of my own life. And then over the last 20 years or so, having the opportunity to help other people along in that journey. So, so this book specifically uh, has a lot of case studies. It has reflection questions. Um, and the, the case studies are all stories of real people that I, that I know and love and have, have journeyed alongside. And so I guess the, the main message of the book is, is that there is hope. And as one who has been there, who has been trapped in the cycle of addiction and bad choices, um, there is real hope. Not just that you can survive, but that you can be healed and that you can thrive. And that, that and then there's real practical tools um, available um, for people who, who are, are, are willing and, and, and eager to, um, to walk out that journey of hope. So I guess the first, the first part would just be to say there is hope. And as a person who has gone through recovery himself, I can say, yes, there is hope for you. And secondly, to, to, to put something in your hands that can give you at least some ideas of some steps that you can take forward, because oftentimes we might feel like, okay, so you tell me that there's hope, but now what do I do? And that's actually where this book, why this is my second book, is the first book is sort of just really about restoring hope, and the second book is about, so how do you live that life of hope? How do you grow in relationship with God? And so um, I, that's, that's what people, I think, will find and are finding um, in the pages of this book. Well, there is hope, and there's no need to be trapped, which uh, really leads us to the most important part of the program, and that's the second chance part. As, as all of us know that uh, love Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God has given us that Second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth, twentieth chance. He's come into our lives and changed us and cleansed us and and has formed us into the person that he wants us to be. And there's people out there right now, TJ, that are in a spot where they're on that, uh, they feel trapped, they feel like that life that they had, is they have that is just not what they're supposed to have. It just, they've been searching and searching and searching, and now they realize this is what they've been searching for, and they want to get set free. TJ, would you lead those listeners that are ready to be uh, set free and to ask Jesus Christ to be Lord of their life the opportunity to do so? Sure, absolutely. Um, to, so shall I pray for them and then also invite them to follow me in a prayer? Absolutely. Father God, I thank you so much that you designed us for a relationship with you. I thank you that we... Um, and come, because of the sacrifice of Christ, into an interactive, conversational relationship with you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will come and live inside of us, that you have done that for me. And I pray right now for those that are listening to this broadcast, that even if they're struggling, even if right now they're feeling um, like they don't know how to do this, Lord, I ask that, that you, Holy Spirit, would even now speak to them and draw them to yourself. Um, I pray that you would give them the gift of faith. So if you, if you right now want to enter into a relationship with Jesus, it's very, very simple. Um, all you have to do is to ad- admit that you are broken and that you have messed up and that you, that you need um, Jesus to make a way for you um, to come back into right relationship with God. And the way that Jesus did that was by dying on the cross, by taking all of the, the, the pain and all of, of the suffering and all of the bad things that you have done on himself. So he bears all of that so that you don't have to carry it anymore. You can lay it down with him. So if you just want to pray after me right now, this is the e- just a simple way to do it. You just say something like this in your own heart or even out loud as you're listening. Father God, I admit that I am broken. I admit that I have made a mess of my life and that I need you. Lord Jesus, please forgive me. Thank you that you have made a way for me to come into right relationship with God the Father, with you, and with the Holy Spirit. I accept your sacrifice on my behalf. 
I don't, I'm not going to try to bear my sins or make myself right anymore. I know you are the only one that can make me right. So please, Lord Jesus, make me right. Restore my heart. Restore my body. Draw me into right relationship with you. I choose to accept what you say. I choose to accept that I am now a child of God. And I choose to walk with you, to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Our guest on Second Chances has been T.J. McLeslie. He is the author of the book, Designed for Relationship, Learning to Love God with All We Are. And uh, T.J., uh, the website, the social media site, one more time, if uh, they would like to learn more uh, about uh, you and your work and obtain a copy of the book. Yes, the website is for the book is www.dfrbook.com. Um, and actually, if they just go to that site, www.dfrbook.com, through that site, there's links to my, my other social media and, and, and as well. Well, TJ, we want to thank you so much for joining us here on Second Chances, and may the Lord continue to bless uh, all the work that uh, He has for you in, in the minish, uh, mission field. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Greg. May God bless you as well. Thank you. Our guest has been T.J. McLeslie. Tune in next week for more Second Chances right here from Advantage Radio Ministries.